having me. Uh, it's, been, it's been an honor to be here. Um, I'm also just very appreciative of the Abbasi Center, particularly uh, Professor um, Farah Sharif. Yeah, I'm gonna I, you know, have a pretty specific topic I wanted to cover today, but uh, I'm gonna try to keep it a little bit short and just um, provide time for anybody to ask questions. You can see that um, I'm really deeply interested in um, long-time student of kind of uh, intellectual traditions in um, Muslim West Africa. So if you have you know, broader questions about that subject or you want to have a conversation elsewhere, um, I'm happy to do that also. Um, so this is a, a conversation uh, really about two subjects, the tafsir uh, tradition in West Africa, the tradition of Quranic exegesis. Um, and then from a, you know, using a particular source, which is called the Fik Fi Riyal Tafsir. Um, this is a six volume uh, Arabic uh, uh, Tafsir that was actually performed or, or um, given worthy in 1964. It was recorded on cassettes. Um, and then some of the Mauritanian disciples of this particular Senegalese Sheikh, um, Sheikh Ramias, um, um, and you can see the town of Kaulak there, kind of in the middle of the map where he's from. Um, so he gave this tough year in 1964, it's recorded on cassettes, and then um, it took a couple of decades actually for the um, kind of tedious process to get the um, tough seer trans transcribed into Arabic, and that's been published in the last 10 years or so. Um, uh, we do not have a lot, a lot of um, original tough seers written by West African scholars. Um, this is not, it, there's, I, mean, I would say there's probably four main ones that we're aware of. Um, we have the Zahid al Breeze of Muhammad Yadali, um, who died in 1753 from modern day Mauritania. We have the Ziyad Tawil of um, Dan Tafa, who's the uh, nephew, I think, of Usman Dan Tawil, the so-called Caliphate. Um, and there are a couple of others um, so this is a, you know, this was a, a, an extraordinary event to have this uh, book published and to have the capacity to kind of gain insight into the tafsir tradition of West Africa. Um, what it does indicate, however, I mean, this is sort of, um, it was sort of fortuitous that this thing was even recorded or that the tafsir was even recorded. I think what it, it should signify to us is that there was a very long and well-pronounced tafsir tradition uh, in West Africa um, that um, if we only look at the written record, we're actually going to be, um, we're not going to be fair to that kind of uh, tafsir tradition. So I'm going to spend a little time in this talk just going through the basics of, um, you know, who was the particular scholar that I'm talking about, uh, what is tafsir and how do, we, how do we think about it, some of the sources for, for tafsir, and then I really want to focus on a couple of ideas and how um, and kind of look at this question of intertextuality, look at the ways in which this West African tafsir was in dialogue, of an unspoken dialogue, with other kind of great masterpieces of tafsir from the global uh, Muslim world. Um, and my core argument is that um, unlike other um, kind of assessments of the tafsir tradition in West Africa, um, even of the tafsir of Sheikh Ramias, I'm not the first one to write about the tafsir of Sheikh Ramias. Um, uh, there's been a sense in this previous literature that yes, tafsir exists, and yes, it, you know, it's at a high level, but it's sort of um, derivative, right? That it, it's basically beholden to particularly one uh, source, namely the Tafsir of Jalalain, uh, which is written um, by Jalal al Din Mahalli and Jalal al the later died in 1505 in Egypt. Um, and this particular text was thought to characterize all of the Tafsir tradition for the most part in West Africa. What I want to do in this talk, or the paper that I wrote for this talk, is to kind of suggest that in fact um, there's this very, very there's this other very, very interesting tafsir, namely the Ruh al Bayan, that comes out of the Ottoman Empire um, by the Sheikh Ismail Haki, died in 1725, um, who 
which is a sort of masterful summary, I think, of uh, Sufi perspectives on the Quran, uh, draws on the work of um, Kashani, who represents the Akbarian tradition and many others. Um, uh, and, and so in this dialogue of Shehran Nias' tafsir between uh, Tafsir Jalali coming out of Egypt um, and Ismail Haqqi's Ruh Bayan coming out of the Ottoman Empire, between this is actually a very, very interesting, I would say original, um, uh, Tafsir articulation produced by the West African scholar. And I think that's a very, very important um, argument to make because it kind of speaks to the um, intellectual um, contributions of West African Muslim scholars uh, in an original way now. Well, sort of, obviously they're in dialogue <coughs> with the global uh, currents of Muslim scholarship, but they're not um, you know, derivative in any, in any way. Okay, um, so this is just a picture of Benina by Kaulai. Um, where this tafsir was performed. So the tafsir would have been performed outside of the mosque here. This is um, the building that you see right in front of the mosque is actually where Shehbar Nias is buried. Um, today, the tomb is outside of the mosque, but uh, on the other side of the mosque would, would have been where during the month of Ramadan in particular, but also um, sometimes preceding Ramadan a little bit or sometimes extending beyond it a little bit. Um, <coughs> The Sheikh would have sat probably after Asr, according to most of our um, the world traditions, um, and taught the tafsir until the month of time, okay, or sometimes after his work. Um, the, the important thing to you know, I, I assume that most of us have heard of this Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Ryan Mias. Um, he, he becomes, I, I would say, essentially the well, he claims about 60 million followers uh, throughout West Africa and beyond by the time of his death in 1975. Um, <coughs> difficulty kind of verifying these numbers, but um, I heard on the radio program recently that um, there are 40 million followers of Shehra Nias in Nigeria alone. Um, we know that he has followers all the way from Sudan. Uh, there's, there's Qataris, living with me uh, that are followers of this Sheikh, they're, sheik, they're followers of the Sheikh in Indonesia and in India today. So truly a global movement, um, and I think it's difficult to kind of uh, overemphasize the importance of uh, this size of a knowledge network, and, and I hesitate to call it a movement, it's not a political movement, but it's essentially a, a knowledge network. Um, uh, and the way in which this has sort of escaped um, you know, analysis of, of the Muslim world, the contemporary Muslim world, that are pulled into this kind of center periphery argument. Uh, this is a this is a knowledge network or a community that dwarfs the Muslim Brotherhood, that probably dwarfs the Sal the so-called Salafi movement. Um, you know, this is certainly one of the largest uh, and most important knowledge communities in West Africa, probably in the whole Muslim world, but yet. Very few, um, I think, you know, I've written a book about it. Um, I know one other professor has written a book about it um, in Germany. Um, but this is an important story to be told. Um, and so um, one of the ways of telling, that I think the core element or the core kind of motivating factor of this knowledge community is really surrounding um, the actualization of knowledge of God. Right. And um, I'm translating this as gnosis with an asterisk. Um, I know it's a problematic translation of, of this concept called the ma'arifatullah, but it basically means, um, you know, in Arabic we have this distinction between ma'arifa and ilm, just like in French between savoir and connaissance. So there's an idea then that you have knowledge of an entity, an awareness of a being, um, um, a direct experiential awareness of God rather than an objective knowledge of an object, right? Um, so that's what we mean, what we mean by ma'arifa, this kind of idea of having a direct experience of an entity, in this case God, that you can't sort of put into words per se, you can't objectify that, that knowledge, but you know what it is, right? So that's what I mean by ma'arifa, and so basically what Shehra Mias does then is, um, 
draw on this earlier discourse of, uh, within the Sufi tradition about the purpose of the Sufi path and indeed of, of, of human existence is to have the knowledge of God, right? Uh, based upon the verse of the Quran uh, where uh, God says in the Quran, according to Muslims, uh, we have not created the jinns and the men except to worship me. Uh, in the earliest tafsir, Ibn Abbas says, worship me means to know me, right? So that the purpose of human life is to know your creator. Um, and so Shayrim then is, has this uh, methodology that he calls tarbiyah, kind of spiritual training, by which he means something very specific, which is the, the capacity then to deliver the knowledge of God to disciples that are sincere, right? And so what he does basically is, um, essentially take the, the very lengthy, so of course this Sufi knowledge takes or, or um, is delivered, traditionally speaking, within a larger context of the Illumidin, of the kind of disciplines of knowledge transmission. Um, and you would generally uh, acquire, if you were able, this kind of very rare uh, direct knowledge of God if you were an old man uh, who had time to make khalwa, you know, spiritual retreat for lengthy periods, 40 days or more. Um, and, what, and, and, so, and that would be after you studied your Arabic grammar, your, you know, your theology, your jurisprudence, and all the other subjects that you would have had to acquire. And so what Shevran does is basically flip the system on its head, right? And says, um, the knowledge of God is the most important thing for us. It doesn't mean that we're going to ignore the other things. Um, but the, the truth is, you need to, the, the essence of all of the, um, the disciplines is the acquisition of knowledge of God. This is where it all comes back to. And so he represents this in a poem by saying, Nobody, uh, sorry to bring this off again. Nobody comes to me and does not know God, the eternal sustainer, young or old, since the beloved prophet. The sanctuary has come close, men or women, beggars or sovereigns, had I wished this Vedo of this flood that have quenched all the thirsty lands. So he's specifically saying that this is not just for old men, right? It's for young men, it's for women, it's for people of noble descent, people of formerly enslaved descent, right? Um, and so this is the, the book cover of the book that I, I kind of wrote about this earlier on. Um, and just to kind of, uh, this comes out of the translations that uh, I was able to do from uh, Shevran Yass's magnum opus that Kesh uh, and how he sort of describes um, the experience of knowing God. So the kind of irony here is that he's specifically saying, you know, our knowledge, Right, that our knowledge is a knowledge of tasting, of experience, and not a knowledge of papers. The irony, of course, is that he does record some of this um, uh, as a sort of invitation, not to say that you know, reading the text is not going to stand in for the actual experience, but you should know that this experience exists, so that you be motivated and thirsty for it, right? Um, and so you can basically see that this is a description of a knowledge in opposition, right? You can, uh, you can basically describe what the knowledge is not, but you can't actually describe what it is, right? Um, welcome, this is my old classmate. Um, know that when a servant comes near to God through the Nawafos, derogatory good works, God enraptures him, loving him with a forceful attraction. In this rapture, the servant is not aware of himself or anything else, neither what came before nor what will come after, neither of any part of himself or the whole of himself. He becomes absent from his personal, personal witnessing and is consumed in the intensity of his master's summoning. Glorious and exalted is he. In this state, he witnesses the divine presence as before the world and after the hereafter, as before the before and after the after. This presence has no beginning and no end, no above and no below, no right and no left. No explanation and no definition. No name and no attribute, no going forward and no going back, no connection and no separation, no going in and no going out, no sensation and no realization, no incarnation and no fusion. 
the lover becomes extinct in his beloved, and he becomes extinct with his own extinction. Nothing remains except the divine selfhood. So this is how he's describing what it means to have the experience of knowing Allah, a direct encounter with the divine. Right? After which your faith, you know, you, you move in your religious identity from a person who submits, performs the five pillars, to somebody who believes, believes in the unseen, to somebody who has ihsan, who worships God as if he sees him. Because if he doesn't see him, surely he knows that God has seen him. So this is the, the idea then of having this direct encounter so that you can actualize your religious identity, right? So that you know it's no longer a belief in the unseen, that right? you, you are seeing God with the eyes of your heart. Um, and so how does this happen? Because he's just specifically saying, like, what is the relationship between that individual that's obtained extinction, right? Because he's saying this is not hulul, this is not um, fusion. Right? Uh, or, or, or incarnation, rather, incarnation, right? Um, that the person has not become God, right? It's not, if you have also, it's not the fusion, uh, or not union, it's not the union between two, th two things, because one thing doesn't exist, only the one exists, right? So, how does he describe this? And this is a, a, a poem that he cites. In this embrace, there is no union and no separation. Exalted is he from either of these. How is it possible for the like of me to contain the like of him? How can the tiny star be compared to the full moon? But it happened that I saw him in the purity of my inner being. There I saw perfection too mighty and exalted to be partitioned, just as the full moon shines its face in the still pond, although it shines high in the heavens. So this is an illusion about the how it is that the human being has the capacity to realize the full knowledge of God essence, the, the, that Allah, the essential being of God, can perceive the essential being of God in the mirror of the heart. Okay. Um, what happens to such a person that has been enraptured, right, and so they speak about this idea of knowledge, so the very synonyms of the ma'arifatullah, uh, the, the gnosis or the direct encounter with God. Uh, one, we already spoke about thawq, which is tasting, right? You experience the divine presence in this way. Um, another word is jal, right? Jal means that you've been like enraptured, like attracted, that you've been taken over by God, right? Uh, we can also talk about istirraq, you've drowned in the divine presence. Talk about fana, you become extinguished in the divine presence. These are all synonyms then that kind of relate different because the idea of Mariva itself, of Gnosis, cannot really be put into words, right? So these synonyms that all uh, indicate to you what the Sufis are trying to uh, uh, communicate by this experience, which essentially cannot be put into words. So what happens to the person who has become enraptured in this way, and those of you that are familiar with the Hadith Qudsi, uh, where Again, according to the Muslim tradition, God says, when I love a servant, I become the hand with which he strikes, the foot with which he walks, right? Um, the eye with which he sees, and the ears with which he hears. Um, he's essentially uh, giving explanation of this hadith in this, in this, in this um, passage. The heart becomes the abode of the manifest truth, and God is his tongue with which he speaks. If he were to strike a blow, God becomes his hand with which he strikes, and if he hears, God is his ear with which he hears. The Most High has taken possession of the heart, so he controls, <coughs> control it. I'm sorry, this is done. Uh, I need to do that again. <laughs> he has taken possession of the bodily limbs, so he uses them for what is pleasing to him. He has taken possession of the servant's character traits, so he operates them however he wills for the sake of his pleasure. So this is an idea then that um, that the human being, once emptied of its base desires, can become the vehicle for God's direct action. Right? Um, and interestingly enough, if you think about all of the constituent elements of the human body, or the human in the human condition, rather, then the mind itself can become the organ, right? can become the vehicle of God's expression. Um, so I just want to make the point then that this um, uh, conversation around Sufi knowledge 
for the knowledge of the divine presence, takes place within a larger um, uh, reflection and elaboration of the classical Islamic sciences. So in West Africa, um, and in particular the community of Shaiva and Niaz, these are things that were very much emphasized when we talk about questions of Islam, Islamic knowledge mm -hmm. transmission. Um, it's of course important to sort of recognize what are the, um, you know, why were people affiliating to the legacy of Sheikh Rahman Yass out of Senegal from Nigeria all over the world um, was certainly because of this invitation towards the direct experience and knowledge of God, but that at the same time uh, there, you know, were, were a sort of wider range of Islamic knowledge um, specialization within the community that of course corresponded, corresponded with other uh, traditions around them and before them. Um, and so one was this deep reflection on the idea of um, the adab al ilm right? The, the kind of, what, what are the manners of seeking knowledge and the importance then of knowledge as a conversation around character transformation. Uh, that, that that was the most important thing about what you were actually learning it wasn't that the sort of specifics itself is it how it transformed your character, right? To be closer to the character of the Prophet Muhammad said. So, um, there is this uh, idea that people um, uh, are so transformed are the ones that transmit uh, knowledge through the Ijaza system, right? So that scholarly uh, credentials were conveyed through the possession of the ijaza, uh, which was sort of like a personalized knowledge transmission. So if you were um, if you're a student at Stanford University in the old days, it wouldn't matter that you're at Stanford. What matters is that you're the student of Sheikh Farah ibn Abdul Talib, right? But you, you would assert your scholarly qualifications by your having been a student of Sheikh Farah rather than the institution itself, right? Um, and so what's interesting about the, um, the Ijaza that uh, Shayran Niaz had is that they are uh, truly like a, a global uh, significance and I think kind of represent the fact that um, the classical Ijaza system, which I think defined kind of the summit paradigm or the um, idea of knowledge trans transmission in, in acquisition in the pre-modern context was anything but, it, it was not eclipsed by um, new forms of, of teaching Islamic knowledge in the modern times, right? There was actually coterminous to kind of um, the imposition of colonial style education in the Muslim world and the modern nation state trying to reform type ways of education to make them look like versions of, um, of Westerns um, so-called rational learning. Uh, Coterminous to this, there was a revival of the summit paradigm. There was a revival of the Ijaza system of, this, of these classical ways of licensing um, that um, you can really see when you look into the, the literature with uh, Sheikh Rahim Niaz. Again, this is coming from Senegal, but he's connected with, you know, um, uh, Abdullah Tayyo, for example, was the student of Abdurrahman Shurbini, who in Egypt led the Muhafizun movement against uh, Muhammad Abdu, who was the Mufti of Egypt that with the collusion of Gordon Cromer and the British colonial occupation of Egypt tried to reform Azhar and the entire Egyptian educational system. Sharini was standing against that, right? Muhammad is literally he's the conservatives, the one that holds on to the, to the, to the um, tradition. Um, and so then, you know, Abu Haid Batani, very famous scholar coming out of um, Morocco, um, and, and many others besides. Um, uh, so, uh, within, of course, there's a discourse about jurisprudence too, of, of fifth and fifth tradition, very much central to these communities also. People, I mean, Shivai Niaz was offering books about Islamic jurisprudence as he was about grammar, Arabic grammar, that I didn't include here. But this is, I think, you know, and, and this is consistent with other Muslim communities in West Africa, the community of Usman Dan Kodi and others. Yes, they're identified as we know them externally often as Sufis, but we should pay attention to the, how they define themselves. And of course, Sufism then was considered one of the disciplines that they studied. 
Um, but it wasn't the only discipline. Right? Um, um, right, so I won't mention all of this stuff right now, but um, so, so yeah, this idea then of Marifa being the, the core, um, Sheva Hans writes in a very, very early poem, um, whoever does not obtain the knowledge of God, his life has been in ruin for all time, especially. Right? Um, that, that whoever does not taste this, this is really what um, should be the goal of all of the of, of knowledge acquisition. Um, so Quran learning in Tafsir, what kind of role does this play within the broader framework? And I think that's the kind of point that I wanted to make here is that um, the Tafsir tradition really bring, draws upon this long-term um, idea. I think the Quran, uh, Quran learning is, you know, from a very, very early on, um, all of our evidence about Islam in West Africa from a very, very early period, from Ibn Battuta and even before, is really accentuating the central role that Quran learning played in the constitution of Muslim communities in West Africa. Um, from Ibn Battuta saying, you know, this is one of their, the West Africa, he doesn't approve of everything that's going on in West Africa, among the Muslim communities in West Africa, but he says, this they do better than anybody. It's Quran learning for every. Um, and they'll, they'll tie up their children in the mosque until they become out this Quran. <laughs> right? um, so this is the reason, of course, that um, enslaved West Africans, when they found their way into America, 20 years later, after being completely removed from any sort of written record of the Quran, could re rewrite the Quran from memory. Right? Um, so this idea that the Quran had to be internalized to actually be truly known, um, I think, was important. Um, but it also, as Rudolf Ware points out in his book about um, uh, the walking, you know, the walking Quran, uh, one of the things that he says in there is that this was not exclusive of tafsir. The idea that you memorize the Quran, that you internalize its disposition, that you literally drank the dissolved words of the Quran, washed off your tablet, and internalized them was not exclusive of tafsir, of tafsir of the exegetical tradition, right? And that we have to think about these walking Qurans as producing tafsir all the time, right? Even your bodily movements then were an expression of tafsir, because if you were the walking Quran, then what, how you comported yourself should be a reflection of, of the Quran itself, right? Um, so tafsir then, I think, from this perspective, has a very, very wide application um, in West Africa. The idea of the um, uh, public tafsir, this is very, very interesting. There have been scholars such as Tal Tamari that have looked at um, tafsir traditions in West Africa. Um, and what she's pointing out, and I think, um, he, sorry, uh, what he's pointing out, uh, I think is uh, probably relevant for us in Senegambia also. Um, the public tafsir that takes place during Ramadan, which many scholars, including myself, kind of look at that and say, oh, this, is, this has always been happening. I can see this always happening, right? But you don't sort of question it. Um, it seems that in West Africa, um, our earliest uh, record of public teaching during the time of Ramadan was actually for Hadith study, not the Quran. And so interestingly enough, what's happening in Medina Baye, Kelda, of Shayran today, there's this very, very prominent scholarly lineage that um, uh, joined the community during the time even of Shayran's grandfather. This is the Sise lineage that goes back to the ancient kingdom of Ghana and perhaps before. Um, interestingly enough, the head representative of the Sisi lineage today still teaches from the, the Sahih of Bukhari, uh, the, the Hadith scholarship in Ramadan after the Zohar or the, the midday prayer, while the descendants of Sheikh Rahim will teach the tafsir after Asr, right? So there's this, there's this interesting way in which the tradition, I think, inherited from Timbuktu of teaching the Hadith during Ramadan is still maintained while tafsir now. Um, and, I, uh, and so according to Kal Tamari, the public um, in, in cities like the ancient um, scholarly center of Jenne along the Niger River, she does, or he does, um, 
um, you know, some, some ethnography there to suggest that public tafsir didn't really happen until the 1940s or maybe a little bit earlier. Um, and that seems consistent with Sheikh Rahim because when Sheikh Rahim first makes his um, uh, first emerge or makes the first call to that theta, right, that, that he possesses this flood of knowledge that anybody who wants to know God should come to him, it's actually the, it's a call to tafsir, right? He basically says, he does that because he says, I am going to now teach the tafsir during Ramadan um, with or without permission from my older brother, right? Because hiding knowledge is haram, he says, right? So he, 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 he teaches this. Um, it may be that he sets off a trend throughout um, Senegambia um, of this public performance of, of teaching the Quran. But I think it is consistent. What we do know, of course, is that um, when we when we look at the scholar, scholarly biography, so say Ahmed Baba uh, of Timbuktu, when he talks about studying with his teachers, he, he does mention tafsir. He doesn't mention any books that he studied, but it seemed that you know so tafsir was sort of learned in a more one-to-one -one basis. This kind of idea of the public performance of tafsir, um, probably a more uh, Innovation, but with the Hassan, like good innovation. Um, just for those of you that are aren't aware um, of where tafsir or exegesis fits within the Quranic sciences, um, this might be useful for you. These are what people would usually study uh, of the sciences, the Urban Bull Quran, the things that were related to the sciences of the Quran. You would know the basic history of its jama'an, that's important for aswab al nuzul right? The circumstances of revelation, you need to know when things were collected, um, uh, when a certain verse came down, right? Um, so then, of course, you, uh, you obviously start with hymns, memorization. Um, you would pivot from there to understanding the grammar of the Quran, uh, the Arabic grammar. You might study khat or various forms of calligraphy, right? Um, you would study the different Qur'an, there are seven different Qur'an, right, different readings. Uh, there's one that was specific to Mecca, <coughs> one that was specific to Medina, and the, the, the type of reading of Qur'an that was specific to Medina now is the one that characterizes, which is the Warsh way, is characterized as the recitation of the Qur'an in North and West Africa, whereas the rest of the Muslim world is following the way of recitation from that was pronounced in Mecca, the Hafs, right? This is why you say Sabi Surah al Ali in West Africa instead of Sabi Surah al Ala in the rest of the Muslim world. So there's differences and slight difference in the pronunciation. Um, there's the science then of Tajweed also. Um, and oftentimes, this in the contemporary Arab world, this is often, you know, this is what people are teaching and sort of. Um, reflecting on primarily. Um, and Western North Africans don't have as an elaborate uh, science of tajweed developed. Uh, this could be because there's an interesting uh, ikhtilaf or difference of opinion about a very important narration. And one of the, so the narration goes from Ibn Kathir, uh, where the Prophet says, adorn the Quran with your voices. But the same tradition is related by Qurtubi, who is the famous Maliki scholar from Cordoba that just moved to Egypt. He says, adorn your voices with the Quran. Right, so there, um, and, and, uh, and so you have these kind of alternative narrations that kind of support either side, where uh, one hadith that Ibn Kathir relates says, God listens more attentively to a man with a beautiful voice uh, chanting the Quran than a man listens to his singing girl. <laughs> but then an alternative narration says, who has, who, you know, the Prophet is asked, who has the best voice for chanting the Quran? The Prophet says, it is he who, when you hear him, you see that he fears God. Right? So there is this, um, I would say, de emphasis of the Tajweed sciences in North and West Africa, not to say that they don't, you know, uh, value the proper um, uh, rhythm, tartil, I would say. A recitation, but the kind of elaborate um, uh, fancification, I guess, of, of the voice and, and recitation of the Quran is not something that um, you will often hear by traditionally trained scholars. 
saying the prayer. You must have it. You, you, you know that they fear God, but you must have it. <laughs> so, um, all right. I think, uh, what, what, how much time do you have? get to some of these verses so I can kind of make the point about how the Tafsir of Shehu um, deals with these um, prior texts and offers something, um, you know, either in the middle or something, uh, but you said only five minutes, yeah? No, no, I, I want to be faithful to you. No, I don't. Okay. Yeah. okay. Seven minutes? Okay. All right, so um, I wanted to go through a couple of different um, ayahs of the Quran that I think were important in the tafsir of Shaiwa Nias for um, highlighting or foregrounding the importance of the direct experiential knowledge of God, right? Um, so one is the, you know, the first, uh, right? those who believe in the unseen, First verses in the current uh, order of the Quran from Surah Al-Baqarah. Um, how is this understood? How is the unseen itself understood? The ghayb, the things that you can't see, right? So this is the this is the description then of the believers. The Quran is a revelation for the believers who believe in the unseen, right? What is the unseen? So a Kashani, he says, and this is uh, Kashani, but a lot of Kashani, his Tafsir is often mistaken, as sometimes erroneously said, it's the Tafsir of Ibn Arabi. Ibn Arabi didn't leave an extensive uh, Tafsir, aside from several allusions, of course, in the Kutiyat al but um, uh, Kashani was essentially a student of one of Ibn Arabi's students, um, and so he's thought to sort of represent the Akbarian tradition. So he thinks about this idea, so he says faith is of two types, that derived from Taqlid and that from Tahqiq. Verified faith is also of two types, or Tahqiq, that derived from evidence and that derived from unveiling. And these can stop at the extent of knowledge, at the extent of the unseen, or may have no stopping point at all. The first extent of knowledge is a certainty called Ilm Yaqeen, and this is by seeing, uh, and, the, and the next is Ayn al Yaqeen, and the third is Haq al Yaqeen, right? So he basically said that there is an ability um, to have um, a certainty even in one's experience of the unseen, right? So this is something, this actual text was not known in, in West Africa that I'm aware of. Um, but the potentiality of this, I think, is followed up with uh, right? and I, I wanted to point out how. Um, so in the Tafsir Jalali and the Hashiyat of Sawi, which is a, a book written by Ahmed Sawi of the Khawati Sufi order, who dies in Egypt in 1825, um, is a much more restricted idea of what the unseen is, right? Um, or, it, or I, should, I should say a restricted idea of how one can experience the unseen, right? So, um, uh, the Tafsir Jalalain says, which as you probably are aware, if you're not aware of this text, the Tafsir Jalalain is often been called the Arabic translation of the Quran. In other words, it's very, very succinct. It essentially gives the one line, one line of the Quran, it gives one further sentence of explanation, it stops there. But what it does in that one sentence is to sort of really um, summarize the previous consensus on that topic, at least in, um, uh, the scholarly perception. Um, so it says um, that means affirming things they cannot see, such as the resurrection, paradise, and hellfire. And on this always, he doesn't think that's enough. So he adds, it can also mean the angels, the throne, the footstool, the tablet, the pen, the Lord in his attributes, glorious and exalted is he. So very specifically then, on the Sawi and the previous, the Tafsir Jalalain seems to suggest that you have to believe in the unseen because these things you are things you cannot see. You will not be able to have certain knowledge of, and that includes God Himself, right? So with the Rosh Bayan, you'll see that he's actually problematizing 
Ismail Haqi is actually problematizing that motion, right? He says, know that the unseen is of two types, the unseen that is hidden from you and the unseen from which you have hidden yourself. That which is hidden from you is the realm of spirits. This world was present to you when you were existing only as spirit at the time of the primordial covenant of uh, Am I not your Lord? The spirit who listened to the address of the real and the manifestation of divine lordship and witnessed the angels, this is every human spirit, uh, and came to know the spirits of the prophets and the saints and others. But this world became hidden from you when the spirit became attached to the corporal form and you came to perceive the five senses, or rather the senses pertaining to the world of bodies. As for the unseen from which you have hidden yourself, that is the presence of divinity, which has become hidden from you by the creation. But he is not hidden from you by the creation, for he is with you wherever you are. And you are distant from him, but he is close to you. As he said, we are closer to you than your jugular vein. So Shevach Nias then, without actually referencing this, it's clear that he's inspired by the Ruhan Bayan, and uh, an oral testimony when I asked Sheikh to then the current Imam of Medina Bayan, he said, yes, Shevach Nias had a particular love for Ruhan Bayan. He considered his one happy and he to have the same mushroom, right, the same kind of spiritual draught or taste. Um, so, and he, so Shemram says, those who believe in the unseen are those who believe in that which was, has been hidden from them. There are two, there are two types of hidden manifestations. He's almost a direct um, quotation or exploration of the meaning of Ramadan without mentioning it. Um, there is that which is hidden from you, which is paradise, of fire and angels, and the pure spouses of paradise, and the resurrection and subsequent proceedings. These things have been hidden from you, and you believe in them. So basically saying what the Tafsir Jalalain said, first of all, right? You see, I, I'm making an argument that it's essentially be, between these two uh, major works. The other type of hidden matter, the Allah, is that which you have hidden yourself. And this is the presence of God, the praise and exalted. The presence of God is not absent. It is closer to you than everything else. If you do not notice this presence, it is you who are absent from it, and not it which is absent from you. So he's basically rephrasing what Ismail Haqqi had already said, but I think putting it in a very much more direct uh, way. All right, so I'm just going to skip through, um, and I want to go through one other example to kind of make this point. Um, and this is this very interesting uh, uh, item of Quran, the creation of the heavens and the earth, the alteration of night and the day. There are signs for those of sound mind. Those who remember God standing, sitting, and lying on their sides, and who meditate the uh, on the creation of the heavens and the earth. Um, did I skip something? Okay, so th there's this, uh, first of all, there's this reflection on what it means to remember God. And I won't go through that in the interest of time, but um, just to kind of remind myself and you, what's, what's meant by remembrance actually corresponds to this idea of the primordial covenant, right? That this knowledge, this cognizance, is something that's invested within each human spirit, right? From the time, be from the pre-eternity, right? From the time before the creation of bodies. And so what's at stake with the remembrance of God is actually remembering something that your spirit, every single human spirit, already knew. Right, so this is what this is what's meant by the acquisition of Marifa in this case is is to remember something that you already knew. Um, okay, so you can the, the basic point here is that there's a close correspondence again between the Rosh uh this Ottoman tafsir from the early uh, 18th century, and Shayrat Nias's uh, tafsir from the from the 1960s. Um, now, as for the contemplation of the Creator, this is, this is where we get into really interesting territory, right? Because there's a hadith that says, contemplate the creation, but do not contemplate the Creator, right? That the mind's contemplation, rational contemplation of the infinite being of God cannot return any significant insights, right? It's just going to end up confusing yourself, right? So what you should contemplate or reflect upon, rationally speaking, is God's creation, not the, the, the that of Allah. And of course, 
this is, I think, based upon Al Ghazali's tripartite discussion of the various levels of the knowledge of God. We have the knowledge of God at God's works, the afal, of his attributes or names, the safat of asma, and the knowledge of God at his essence in um, the that of Allah. And Al Ghazali, in his book, Jawai al Quran, the pearls of the Quran, or jewels of the Quran, he lays out, I mean, it essentially classifies all the different ayahs of the Quran as speaking to one of these three types of knowledge, right? So the knowledge of God's works are how what a God does with the creation, the rising of the sun and the moon, uh, uh, how um, the, the previous communities and their prophets, that's all of God's works. God's attributes are the 99 names, or the attribute of Rahma, of Luf, right? Of mercy and grace. Um, and God's essence can only be described in very few um, verses of the Quran, such as There's nothing the like comparable to him. And this is essentially saying that the essential knowledge of God's essence, his essential being, cannot be put into words. Right? So, um, uh, Ruh al-Bayan actually uh, uh, affirms this hadith in its kind of literal meaning. And it says, the Prophet prohibited the contemplation of the Creator because the knowledge of his specified reality is impossible for the human being. So there is no benefit in contemplation of the essential being of the Creator. Right? Interestingly enough, Hashiyat al-Sawi, which is, tends to be kind of less, um, uh, or, or more of an exoteric commentary than the Ruh al-Bayan, actually indicates that maybe there may be another understanding. It says, contemplation is the result of knowledge and cognizance. And then with Ma'arifa, Abu Hassan al-Shazari said, one grain of the heart's worship is better than a mountain's weight of the body's worship. Indeed, the fruit of meditation, or fikr, that's the same root, is the derivation of evidence in the cognizance of God. Right? So he said, basically suggests that um, meditation or contemplation of God can lead to knowledge of God himself. Right? Um, and so this is what Shehrayim says. Um, he narrates another hadith. He says, um, one moment of contemplation is better than the worship of a year. Contemplation is better than worship because worship is the action of the bodily limbs while contemplation is the action of the heart. There are people whose worship of God consists of contemplation. They spend the whole night without, without performing one supererogatory prayer cycle because, of, because their worship is contemplation. And here he relates a story of Imam al-Shafi going to the house of Abu Hanifa, visiting him. And one of the people that was serving Abu Hanifa says, Abu Hanifa has spoken so highly of this great Imam. These are these jurists of the um, uh, 8th and 9th century. Um, that I want to see what he does at night, right? Because I know Abu Hanifa, my teacher, he spends half of the night praying, making extra rakas, okay? So he goes to see uh, Imam Ashafi, and he just kind of sits outside of his door, but in between his door is where he would have to go make ablution. So he, he sees him go in at night, he doesn't see him come out until Fajr. So he goes back and he says to Abu Hanifa, this man is not who you think he was. He just went to sleep, and uh, when he came out to pray Fajr, he didn't even go to make wudu. So he prayed, so he slept all night and he prayed the dawn prayer without making ablution. <laughs> and uh, Abu Hanifa says, it's not what you think, right? So Imam Shafi then describes that he actually just spent the whole night sitting down and thinking about God, right? And that he never performed any extra prayer, but that his worship was contemplation. So this is what Shirai means by this. He goes on to say that this contemplation of the heart of God, keep in mind how he's saying this, right? The action of the heart, so it's not an action of the mind. And this is how we can get around this hadith. The contemplation of the common folk is the contemplation on the creation of God, and they're deriving evidence for it for the Creator. But the contemplation of the elite is on the essential being of God. Contemplation on the essential being of God is forbidden like the Hadith says, for the common folk, because they are incapable of describing the essential being of God, for it has no where and no how, no bottom, no top, and no limbs. If the common people think about this being, they will end up rendering God as a watermelon, and they will fall into something impermissible. Contemplation of the essential being of God is for the 
belief. And for them, in the narration, one moment's contemplation is better than a year's worth of worship. Um, and, and each statement is relevant to its, um, its spiritual station. So he's essentially saying here that, that the, con the heart's contemplation of God um, is, has the capacity, if, if you remember how I kind of started this conversation, of the heart's ability to see the full being of God according to the Hadith Qudsi. I, God says, according to Muslims, I who cannot fit into the heart, uh, I who cannot fit into the universe's defined universes can fit into the heart of the sincere believer. And this is what Shay Ryan means, that this contemplation is the true, um, is the true worship, right? And once that contemplation happens, then that's, that's with you forever, right? Um, so I think this is really, you know, represents uh, in dialogue with previous sources of tafsir, none of them that I'm aware of have come out so forcefully and explicitly about, you know, the urgency of the direct contemplation of the divine essence and the human's capacity to achieve that in its transformative potential for the human being, right? So I think that in dialogue with these previous sources, you can see Shea Ryan kind of building this argument by taking from these variety of interesting and very disparate sources to build, I think, an original contribution to tafsir literature that comes out of context of Black West Africa. And I think that's something that we and Islamic studies should pay more attention to. Thank you very much. <laughs>